Hi, I'm Matthias, and this is, well, technically not a Colt 1911, popularly known as the Kongsberg Colt. It's a near clone made and issued in Norway, their model of 1914, which is, frankly, a bit misleading on its face. We'll cover that more, though, however, after we get a better look at this in the light box. I don't think anybody's going to be amazed when I say that the overall length of this pistol is eight and a half inches, and that its weight is right at about 2.4 pounds. It's very familiar. It also has a detachable single stack box magazine that contains seven rounds of 45 ACP. I really probably could have recycled all of our footage from the 1911 episode, except for, well, you might have noticed some slight differences. Today's episode is, for now, the last of a fairly spread out series on the development and adoption of the Colt's Patent Firearms Government Model of 1911 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol. For the first time in visual storytelling history, we've managed to trace the origins of this handgun all the way back to Browning's model of 1900. None of this would have been possible, however, if not for support from viewers like yourself, who shared their bite-sized donations with us every single month on Patreon or Player. Please, if you haven't done so yourself, consider doing the same. A fair chunk of this show's expense has also been offset by what was already, thankfully, my favorite gun oil, Ballastol. The miracle substance in this bright green and red can has spent the last century quite literally preserving firearms history. It's safe for wood, metal, and leather. They've also gone beyond the material and have shared their resources in order to preserve the history itself in the form of this show. I won't lie to you, there are plenty of gun lubricants to choose from, and you can certainly test away to your heart's content, but Ballastol's extremely long history of service has absolutely proven its safety for collectibles, never discoloring nor turning to glue. So as long as you apply it lightly and wipe off the excess, everything's going to be all right. Give them a try and let them know that we appreciate their support. In our last episode, we covered the various foreign powers who adopted Colt's 1911 pistol. However, we barely touched Norway's limited orders and didn't address its adoption or domestic production at all. And there is good reason for that. Canada, the United Kingdom, France, and Russia all purchased Colt 1911s as substitute handguns during the desperate scramble for service sidearms thanks to the attrition of the Great War. None of these powers had actually chosen to adopt the pistol in a slow and normal process. Argentina, however, had actually assessed and chosen the 1911, which is probably worthy of a whole episode, except for the fact that the decisions and how they were made seem to be lost to time, or perhaps are buried in paperwork that I have no access to. Regardless, their purchases of original, pure model 1911s are actually fairly small in comparison to their own domestic production of the later model of 1911A1. So that will have to be explored alongside the improved Colt pistol of the interwar period another day. Argentina's adoption also appears to have been an occasion of stumbling onto something good that was already in the market. Norway, however, had actually been present and involved in a fair chunk of Colt's pistol development. We just don't often hear that story. And I'll warn you now, it's frankly one of constant frustration, opposition, bad luck, and stubborn determination. As we've seen before on our show, Norway had adopted the small bore Nagant revolver back in 1893. This became their standard sidearm for the next two decades and remained in service into World War II. Despite being a very modern revolver, single and double action, auto rebounding hammer, small bore smokeless cartridge, it had left something to be desired. Just like the US, Norway had some detractors who didn't favor that little itty bitty 7.5 millimeter cartridge. And honestly, it was a fairly weak option, not only small and light, but also fairly slow. This did not inspire much confidence, especially when paired with limited capacity and singular gate loading and unloading. Even by the end of the 1890s, Norway's Permanent Arms Commission was beginning to eye early auto loaders as a possible solution to the revolver problem. Thanks to personal loans from officers and individuals, they would tinker with the Borchardt, the Bergman, Roth, and even the FN 1900 pistols. All without much follow-up, though. They also investigated the domestic Landstad design, a magazine-fed revolver that apparently performed terribly. By 1904, the number of trials pistols was growing. Automatics were finally starting to flesh out into reliable service pistols. Maybe. That same year, a commission report was released which covered a fairly wide and to us very familiar smattering of automatics. 
The Bergman had held in there, and they got around to looking at the C-96 and the impressive Borchardt Luger. There were submissions from Mon Licker and Roth, although the exact models escaped me, and a string of pistols from the mind of John Moses Browning, the FN 1900 again, the more powerful FN 1903, plus, unusually for Europe, the Colt 1902. We've seen this 38 caliber slide-operated locked breech pistol in action on our show before, frankly one of the better options available at the time despite some of its idiosyncrasies. Overall, Norway's arms commission felt favorably towards automatics. Faster rates of fire, speedier loading, and especially those that featured lock opens on empty were considered exceptional features for military service. The three most striking pistols were the FN 1903, the Colt 1902, and the Borchardt Luger in just about that order. This ranking is frankly quite forward thinking as these three guns together carry the features that would become standard for automatics of the future. Even so, at that point in history, there was no proven track record of service for a mass-adopted automatic pistol. Norway was not a major world power and couldn't afford to be their own guinea pig. Any decision made would have to stick for quite some time, so the commission ultimately stalled for the technology to be developed further. And so the next few years would pass with little onesie twosie testings of a myriad of domestic and foreign designs, many of which were of poor merit and not worth exploring here today. Through a series of introductions, another series of pistols were assessed in September of 1907. Most unique on the list was a new automatic provided by the Danish Recoil Rifle Syndicate. The Skobo, which Norway had trialed in 7.65mm and 11.35, with the larger caliber remaining more relevant as time went on. They also had on hand the Bergman 1903 and 9mm, the FN 1903 reappeared, now anointed by its Swedish adoption, and the Colt 1905 in 45 ACP. Also, apparently, a Piper Bayard pocket pistol in 32 ACP. A domestic option was provided by Norwegian stockmaker Fidjan, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. It was fairly weak, but very simple in construction, and of course, most importantly, native. Over several months, a series of shooting tests were conducted. These included firing hundreds of rounds, accuracy at various ranges, rapid shooting, rust and sand resistance, the usual things that we've become accustomed to over the course of our show. The Piper was of course on its face in no shape to be a martial pistol. Also, it managed to break down anyway. The Skobo suffered frequent malfunction. It was felt not to be fully developed. The bullet was also found to be too light. The Bergman did fairly well, except that it kept running away, usually by firing a pair of shots when one was intended. The FN 1903 and the Colt 1905 both fared very well, though the lack of a safety on the Colt was found somewhat troubling. Both of these were worthy of further consideration. Vigilant's pistol suffered numerous breakdowns and was withdrawn and replaced with an improved example. This too suffered other breakages and malfunctions. But given its simplicity and, again, native design, it was allowed to progress for further consideration anyway. Assuming it could integrate a number of additional desirable features, the Norwegian state would pay for these developments. All of these pistols were found to have better penetration and muzzle velocity than the Nagant service revolver at the time. All were easier to fire rapidly and reload, which at least further endorsed their interest in automatics as a whole. Following up on the trials, once again, time was made for more options to be provided uh, around Norway. The Fidjilen was modified, and during this period, another domestic design was forwarded. Gustav Hansen's pistol, which was introduced by Niels Krag of the rifle fame. After this recommendation, Krag then turned around and invented his own pistol, which was fairly feature-rich, as you can tell by just looking at this thing. And some months later, Harold Sundgaard would supply his own take on the automatic pistol problem. In response to all of this spread, the Arms Commission was asked to issue their general requirements for the next handgun. They weren't exactly certain, so they opted for a set of guidelines instead. 9mm was the preferred caliber, but others would be entertained if they proved effective. The weight should not exceed 1 kilogram. There should be an empty magazine indicator, most likely a lock open device, a cocking indicator, and some sort of safety. I'm unsure if this was intended to be manual or automatic or both. Overall, the Browning 1903 was recommended as a good baseline pistol of merit. Now that indecision around the cartridge was proving to be a major problem as many early automatics liked to play games with ultralight bullets or weird powder loads in order to min-max their bizarre actions into working long enough for them to yell about how they were being cheated by... You get the idea. 
So the Arms Commission spun off a pistol caliber commission which spent much of 1909 investigating the ammunition problem. They had received the US data on the Thompson Lagarde test, which frankly favored big bore heavy hitters. Norway undertook their own test to confirm the same. The ammunition tested ranged from 6.5 mm to 11.43, that being the 45 ACP. Not pictured here are bespoke cartridges from Scobo, Figeland, and Hansen. Those were various forms of 9mm and 11mm, usually much lighter than the foreign options. Like the US, Norway's commission put an emphasis on stopping power. They fired on swinging steel plates, tested wood penetration at various ranges, and wanted to go further with animals and corpses, but this proved to be a bit too difficult or maybe gruesome to range. There were also a series of debates and tests around uh, figuring out the hydraulic effect. This was a loose mix of soft tissue effect and perhaps some consideration of cavitation. Since several cartridges were uh, unique to the submitted Norwegian pistols, the ammo trials also proved an opportunity to observe some of these designs. During its ammo testing, the Fidgeland pistol was permanently disqualified when it blew a firing pin out of its rear, thankfully not injuring the shooter. This did not, as we'll see, remain entirely permanent though. Sungard refused to let anyone but himself fire his pistol, which made testing it all but impossible. Its extremely low muzzle velocity saw it disqualified at this time. Hansen's design had frequent malfunctions and apparently claimed the life of someone at Hansen's workshop while it was being improved. Craig's pistol actually used a commercially available cartridge, so it wasn't needed for ammo testing and therefore didn't need to be observed. Reporting in August of 1909, the commission struggled to compare some apples and oranges results and naturally ended up somewhere in the middle. The resulting suggestion was very close to 9mm Bergman, especially in its dimensions. This was a 9mm jacketed bullet weighing 8.3 grams with a muzzle velocity of 370 meters a second. Because of that long cartridge, this suggestion actually made the commission briefly seem to favor pistols with magazines in front of the trigger, which was not what they had endorsed so far or would ever again. So there was, of course, confusion all over. In September, plans were announced to give a final test of the available pistols. The condition stipulated that the Norwegian Rodfoss Patron fabric would provide cartridges in the aforementioned 9mm configuration. This apparently flew right out of the window come the time of the actual test, though. Colonel Ole Krag objected strongly to the 9mm cartridge. He favored the US 45 ACP or variations thereof. He pointed to the English and American decisions to go with large bore pistols and carried out his own test to prove the superiority of the same. It's worth noting that his pistol was also a large bore capable of handling the 45 ACP cartridge. So, when testing started in March of 1910, most of the domestic pistols were using the new 9mm cartridges. The foreign models had all opted to stay with their own original chamberings, and it was, all over again, a mess. The domestics were all there again, and the native designs suffered problems. The commission secretly reported that all had a long way to go for development, or might not be practical at all. The international players include the most updated Bergman design. What's simply recorded as a Browning, I assume this means the FN 1903 once more, a Roth in 8mm, and the Colt, which was now back in 38, listed as just the military model, so I assume all the way back down to the 1902. Interest in the Roth was fairly low. The Bergman was criticized for its aggressive cartridge and its magazine forward of the trigger guard. These were all but inherent to the cartridge that the commission had chosen. The FN 1903 and the Colt 1902 and 38 were well ahead of the pack, with the locked breech 38 preferred. Ultimately, the commission recommended the purchase of 50 Colt pistols with 200 cartridges each for detailed troop trials. This number was later reduced to 25 pistols and negotiations were attempted. Small problem. FN, Fabrique Nationale, had the established right to the Browning's patents in the European market, so this was going to require a fair bit of back and forth, even without Norway's additional requests. One of which was the right to manufacture the Colt design at home. Colt resisted this as they wanted to handle production, making every penny that they could. Ultimately, Norway had to turn towards an internal legal solution. Their own patent law, dating from 1885, held that judicial uh, discretion could uh, establish a fair compensation should the state wish to use a patent when a fair price could not be negotiated in the market. A review was conducted in October of 1910. Curiously, Ole Krag was chosen to represent Colt's interests, 
This was obviously debated, but he affirmed that he was in the best position to understand the associated costs and values and would remain impartial. In the end, it was decided Norway had three options. A lump payment of 25,000 kroner, a payment of three kroner per pistol for the first 10,000, or an upfront payment of 10,000 kroner followed by one kroner 80 for the first 10,000. After this was settled, Fabrique National came forward to assert their rights to the Browning patents, and the whole thing began all over again. While that was going on, the Norwegian designers had managed to leverage some social capital at home. They pointed to their use of the approved cartridge when others had not done so at all. They felt that the commission was not being fair to the domestic interests. This ended up with the commission again being forced to review the available handguns from the native manufacturers. This task actually fell to Jacob Maximilian Grand Pask, now director of Kongsberg Wappenfrauberg. You might recognize the name as one of the inspectors of the previous Nagant revolvers. He now reviewed the latest pistols from Hansen and Sundgaard, and even reviewed yet another Danish Skobo while he was in the process. Actually, there was even an early version of the Dreisen 9mm blowback pistol. All of these failed to impress and were again discarded. Even after all this, the local guys pulled on their political connections, and the government actually passed an order in 1911 to have yet another uh, round of native designs reviewed. This specifically started with one new design by Niels Bjorgum, which you won't be surprised to hear wasn't practical or reliable enough to compete with the headliners. The measure also saw Sundgaard's pistol tested again. This, of course, resulted in petitions from Krag, Fidgeland, and... Hansen. So in April of 1911, two smaller commissions were set up, one for Bjorgum and one for Sungard, and of course we had to look at everyone else's pistol while we were at it. These were sideshows with known outcomes carried out while, uh, over here, Colt's pistol finally saw field trials in the summer of 1911. These were later production Colt 1902 military model pistols. In addition to limited issue, they were loaned out to the infantry shooting school at Turningmoen and assessed by the field artillery NCO school. While there were extremely few malfunctions and some errors in handling, the overall impression was very positive. The big concerns? It shot a bit low, and they felt that the half-cock safety was inadequate for military service. With that caveat, the 1902 was recommended for adoption, and it was hoped that the pistol could be modified quickly and put into service. Small problem. By this time, Colt's patent firearms was well over the 1902 and ready to terminate its production. Starting in 1905, they had prioritized the 45 ACP cartridge in U.S. trials and developed a frankly fantastic Marshall pistol resulting in the U.S. model of 1911. Colonel Craig had, at about this time, traveled to the U.S. to show his own pistol uh, inventions. Having been shown Colt's creation, he immediately recognized its potential and wrote back to the Norwegian general staff that a clearly superior product was available. This did not stop him from continuing to invent pistols and submitting them for trial, though. Yes, it was a better Browning, and it used what he felt was the superior 45 ACP cartridge, and it even had a manual safety. This report ultimately stalled the official adoption of the 38 caliber model of 1902. The Arms Commission once again recommended a new series of tests to be scheduled for the summer of 1912. But the higher-ups recoiled in terror at this proposition. They knew that if they uh, opened up testing again, they would once more be inundated with political opposition from domestic inventors and the whole thing would go cartwheeling down the mountain all over. It was decided, calibered be damned, just order some government model 1911s and quietly see if they're any good. Even with this approach, it won't surprise any of you if I say that they had to go back and test the Sunguard and Krag pistols again in 1912 anyway. Because the 1912 military budget included a condition that no pistol manufacturer could be started until it was fully established whether there was a competitive Norwegian invention available. This constant bickering combined with Colt's focus on the U.S. government orders meant that an example commercial 1911 didn't arrive in Norway until January of 1913. While this isn't the exact pistol, it's one of the same construction, an early series commercial with the dull finish, still a fine blue by modern standards. It was found to be very accurate, provided good ergonomics, the safety improvements over the 1902 were significant, and the cartridge was very powerful, delivering strong on-target performance. Positive results with the 1911, of course, infuriated the Norwegian designers, who began petitions against the move away from a 9mm cartridge. 
38 ACP had been, of course, close enough to the weird 9mm Bergman, but this 45 thing, this is out of nowhere, which meant it was time again for an entire round of trials, scheduled for March of 1914, then extended to April, and almost all the build-up requirements went out the window. Now the pistols must weigh less than 1.15 kilogram. The maximum external dimensions were 24 by 15 centimeters. They must carry a minimum of seven cartridges, use a visible hammer, provide two to three kilograms of extraction force. They need a manual safety and some indication of an empty magazine. This is basically describing the 1911. They knew what they wanted. Craig could not ready his own pistol in time, nor could Bjorgum. Ultimately, only two domestics participated, but four more foreign entries managed to appear. The Colt 1911 was, of course, prominent. Webley and Scott sent over both a 455 and a 9mm self-loader. Schkobo was back. OEWG of Austria provided their latest offering in 9mm. Mauser of Germany sent along both a model 1914 pocket pistol and their attempt at a universal Marshall automatic platform, the 1912-14. The Norwegian options were familiar names, Sungard and Fidgeland. Once again, neither of these had sufficient merit or reliability to effectively compete in the trials. Testing included firing up to 2,000 rounds uh, and included the usual precision, velocity, dust and rust, endurance and reliability trials, and a lot of attention was paid to the impact strength of the projectiles, both in terms of smacking steel and with a controversial bucket rig to check hydrodynamic effects by measuring the pressure created when shooting into a bucket of water. Discarding the political entries, how did the rest do? Well, Mauser's pocket pistol was ignored from the start, being too small and weak. Their larger 9mm had ejection issues and was felt to be prohibitively expensive to manufacture while providing no real additional advantages. The rest of the pistols had various merits, but all suffered from some form of malfunction or had a known deficiency. When compared to the supremely reliable 1911, they all fell away. The Webleys had too many failures to feed or lock open. The Shire's lock open broke down and clip loading is weird anyway. Scobo did fairly well, but again, it was using a ridiculously light bullet that delivered poor penetration. Once again, it was recognized that the Colt product was superior, even more so than with the 38, as it had not suffered a single parts failure in trials. The commission's decision was unanimous. The Colt government model was their choice. It was officially adopted in September of 1914, at which time it was referred to as Colt's Automatic 11.43 mm Pistol Model 1912. The reason for this date isn't recorded, but it's believed to coincide with the production of commercial examples of the Colt government model. The model date would later be changed. This would actually become a point of confusion for the collector community. Normally we would drop straight from adoption into looking at the pistol, but the Norwegian 1914 is something of an unusual case. While the pistol was officially adopted, they weren't looking to purchase any from Colt and instead began plans for domestic manufacture. It was estimated that 10,000 pistols would be needed and they could be made for about 25 kroner apiece. This didn't include one-time tool-up costs of roughly 25,000 kroner, nor did it include payment for the patent rights. Production was to take place at Kongsberg Wappenfabrik, which at the time was also responsible for rifle production, and was knee-deep in expansion of machine gun production. This alone would be a challenge. However, even as testing was being wrapped up, Europe was now at war, and the situation was unusually fierce and growing. Suddenly, it was quite hard to get any international business done, and the resources necessary for arms manufacture were in great demand. Relatively small and neutral Norway would normally just shift from production of one item to another in various series. Until now, there wasn't really a need to have multiple production lines in simultaneous operation. However, despite their neutrality, they did need to make sure that they were well armed as a deterrent against being exploited during the Great War. While the rifles and automatics kept being assembled, the introduction of pistol production lagged way behind, likely, yes, because it was seen as less critical, but also because of some weird snags. Once more, there was some confusion in dealing with both FN and Colts at the same time. Even more so now because Belgium had been invaded and FN was occupied by the Germans. Norway's initial decision was to pay the 1910 assessed 25,000 kroner sum for the Browning patent rights. FN disputed this, saying that the 1911 integrated a fair number of additional patent improvements over the old 1902. They now wanted 35,000 kroner. 
The Norwegians, however, held firm, and frankly there wasn't much FN could do in its current situation. Ultimately, the payment wasn't even sent to FN. Instead, they requested it be sent to Colt's patent firearms. Now, as part of the emerging contract, Colt was to provide technical drawings to Norway. They dragged this matter out until April of 1916, which is also when they were given the 25,000 kroner payment. The drawings, however, were just as awful as they had been for the US government and other manufacturers in the US market, almost useless. Given the long delay, uh, Kongsvert had actually taken to uh, creating some parts based on dimensions taken from example 1911 pistols they had on hand. The same process had to be expanded to allow for complete technical drawings. Even so, it meant that they were working almost blind in regards to steel quality, tempering, and other necessary information. There would be lots of experimentation in the development of a assembly line for these handguns. Norway also attempted to order 2,000 commercial government models straight from the US in August of 1915. However, Colt had to tell them in October that this could not be completed in a timely fashion. The Norwegian Navy, however, had better luck. They ordered just 400 pistols from Colt in 1915. These cost them $18.50 each and 80 cents for each additional magazine, of which there were five for each pistol. Orders were also placed for 70,000 rounds of 45 ACP ammunition. In early 1916, the army decided to at least order some pistols for familiarization, and so an order for 300 was placed. However, Colt could not ship these until January of 1917. Even then, there was actually an error with the import tax paperwork, and customs ended up holding on to the shipment. The pistols were actually returned to Colt and then resold. Once things were straightened out, another different 300 unit order could be sent in May of 1917. Meanwhile, Kongsberg Wappenfabrik had slowly been tackling the issue of production. During 1915 and 1916, they slowly crept up on the problem by producing 100 pre-production pistols. These were subject to a lot of tinkering and changes, but would provide the backbone process going forward into actual serial production. Final assembly and delivery took until 1917, with the first five being sent for testing in June of that year. These were essentially clones of the Colt 1911 commercial model, and therefore already obsolete in Norwegian service, both in terms of minor technical changes and their markings, come to find out. These changes started with the slide legend. While there was no mention of the caliber, it was listed in official documents as 11.43 millimeter. This was the widest measurement of the bore. During development, however, it was decided to rename the pistol from 1912 to model of 1914 for its actual adoption date. And the bore measurements changed to the narrow measurement, 11.25 millimeter. This decision was made before any actual physical changes to the pistol were decided. That means that the Norwegian Model 1912 and Norwegian Model 1914 are exactly the same gun officially. However, in October of 1916, the Arms Commission recommended one clear improvement to the pistol, an extended slide release. This was cheap and easy to implement and provided much better ergonomics, so it was approved. Now, just to be clear, the pre-production guns are all marked Model 1912 and have the plain slide release levers because these processes were finished before those other changes were made. The name was changed during their production, but there was no point in changing the die until serial production began, and there was no point in fitting the extended levers when a little test could be done. Those new extended levers were added for actual production, which is also when the new slide marking was created. This obviously has collectors thinking that a Model 1912 was a plain 1911, and the extended lever was introduced as the Model 1914 in the year 1914. But the documents and process don't bear any of that out. And of course, the gun I have here was from actual production. It has the extended slide release and is marked 1914. So we can finally get a closer look at the Norwegian model of, well, 1914. All right, we have finally the Norwegian 1914. And in this case, it is properly marked as such, 1914. But what did we get? Well, overall, we had what most Americans would call a pre-A1 or original Colt 1911 government model pistol with a doodly bopper right here. The doodly bopper is the only thing that really makes this different. It's still slide uh, operated locked breech browning system. We still have the detachable magazine. Although I will point out Norwegian mags seem to differ somehow 
in very critical and almost imperceptible dimensions that make them frankly loathe US made mags. Also, they kind of don't like Norwegian mags in my experience either, but they do a lot better with them. So, uh, as much as possible, I've tried to run this gun with its original home style magazines. This is just one of several that I have available to me, and I believe that most often you will find them in a near white condition, especially on the side. This one also turned up near white and yet blued on the bottom. I have a feeling that these were supposed to have been a half blue, a lot like the US at some point, and then ended up like this over years of service. Although I guess they could have been white and hardened all the way right from the beginning. I was unable to find clear details on that point. Now I have a fairly large hand and 1911s have not been a problem for me in terms of the slide release. I just stretch my thumb and press and then drop some, well, leverage. It depends on what I'm fighting. If I'm just trying to chamber around, not the end of the world. If the magazine is empty and I'm trying to close a, you know, empty firearm with the magazine in place, it can be a little heavy because I'm overcoming that follower spring. But this, this is slick. Drop down to the rear, nice and handy for everybody to be able to reach. I can get a nice strong purchase on there and then just, oh, no effort at all. And yet very shallow. It's uh, it's actually not very proud compared to the high point of the grip. So it's very unlikely to get bumped or torn up. You don't tend to see damage there. It's frankly surprising that this feature didn't find its way into most 1911s. Even today on a lot of the commercial models, we see you know extended slide releases that come up and over the grip and do fancy things. But it's rare to see this little dog leg and I actually quite like it. I, I think this should be re-explored. Now, while we're zoomed in on the pistol, I wanna make sure I point out that Norwegian 1914s more so than the US 1911s were serial numbered, which of course is a disappointment for people that wanna hot swap broken parts or worn down pieces. But in this case, our serial number ends in 304, and we have 0 .304, 0 .304, 0 .3. Boy, you would know if you had a matching gun, wouldn't you? Even on the other side, we tend to see 0 .304, and oh, up here is our, well, it's the date the slide was manufactured, apparently. This date does not necessarily get added when the gun is completed, at least from the notes that I had available to me from a beautiful book that is referenced in the description of our videos. And below that, you'd have an inspection mark. Best to look those up depending on who your inspector is. We're not gonna give all of it away in the video. Otherwise, why would you read? Interestingly, I found a lot of Norwegian grips that are like these, where it's clearly a lighter wood that's been painted over and then it's worn back through. At the same time, I've also seen Norwegians like this guy, who's a little rougher, but they have plain dark wood grips. So. I'm not sure which is more correct to which era or why these changes were made, but both seem to appear in the collector's market and I don't have uh, an honest explanation for you. Now, normally we don't cover accessories in this show, but I lucked into this holster and it has a very unique setup. Uh, thank you, Folke Mirvang, for helping me find this. Also, look, we have the spare mag pouch of which you get three for a neutral nation. That's pretty impressive actually. So. Uh, what's going on with this holster that I like so much? Well, I've gone ahead and put the pistol inside. As you can see, it sits nice and deep in there. And what's going on here? Well, let's see. You go to draw your handgun. As you lift the flap, watch the birdie. This leather strap that goes down around the trigger guard goes ahead and pulls your pistol free of the leather enough for you to get a good purchase and a decent draw, which by the way, you still have a protected trigger until you're out and clear. For the time, this is actually a really wonderful holster design and I just thought it was worth mentioning. Since this is mechanically just the same as the Colt 1911, which we've already seen in detail during its own episode, I'll skip the animation and get this straight into May's hands for her demonstration.
a fascinating firearm, but we really haven't even reached the point where it was entering true production. That's because, as I said earlier, Norway was struggling with a lack of technical data, having to work by copying existing examples, then struggling to secure tooling and materials during the biggest war anyone had ever known in all of recorded history. Sure, they weren't in combat, but the international market was complete insanity. These problems also extended into Norwegian attempts to produce their own ammunition. Ralfoss Patron Fabric had been contracted to handle the initial supply. Producing 270 sample cartridges in 1916, 250 of these were rejected. The problems were varied. Uh, the case dimensions were slightly off, causing the extractor to mar the rim. That didn't happen in Colts ammo. The bullet had become a point of confusion. The Norwegian Commission had expected a 16 gram bullet, 16.3 uh, millimeters in length. Ralfoss had provided one that was 14.7 millimeters long and only 12.7 grams. I expect this happened due to confusion between the commercial 200 grain 45 ACP readily available in the market versus the US government adopted 230 grain bullet, which is what the Norwegian government expected. Eventually, a 14.85 millimeter long jacketed bullet weighing 13 grams was approved for service, so not quite the same as the US pistol in either direction. In April of 1918, Kongsberg Wappenfabrik was finally able to report that it could deliver 1,500 pistols by the end of that year. This was sadly incorrect, but at least things were moving. One major snag was that Ralfoss was still struggling to deliver their promised cartridges, notably now 10,000 pressure test cartridges that were needed for proofing. No pistols would actually be delivered in 1918. Instead, the end of the Great War finally relieved enough pressure on the army to scale back production of the Krag Jorgensen rifles and carbines. This finally left time to truly dedicate workmen to the pistol problem. Deliveries began in 1919, with nearly 900 being produced. The first of these saw fresher testing beginning in February. Those delivered by June were all marked with the previous year's date, 1918, presumably because the sides were produced at that time. Overall, the markings would remain mostly as they appear here. Slight variations in type, size, or in King Hakon's monogram may be observed as dies wore down and replaced. Also, these lines were added a few years in for reasons I do not understand. But that's a bit nuanced for us today. By 1921, problems were found with the magazine springs, which were quick to lose their tension. This one seems okay, probably because that problem was fixed in 1921 with improved wire and better tempering. By 1924, another issue was noted with the Ralfoss ammunition. It was, uh, compared to Colt's, actually far less precise on target. The matter was resolved by changing the shape of the bullet. Now it was made longer and hollow based, but with the same overall weight. This provided a better center of gravity and better precision. In 1922, long rifle production was halted, and in 1926, carbines followed. Each time, more pistols were able to be produced. By 1928, the rate had risen to 4,000 a year, but this fell to just 1,300 in 1929 due to economic depression and funding cuts. Pistol production would then halt until a small batch of 500 in 1932, and just 100 or so in 1933 and 34. From there, we see just some blips of production all the way until World War II. Small numbers were also produced and sold commercially, usually to private security-like banks. These should be marked with a P next to the serial number for private sale. Now, the plan for the 1914 was to push out the Nagant 1893 slowly, first going to officers, then NCOs, then down to MG teams and various specialists like engineers, aviation, transport, fortress artillery, you guys get the idea. By 1932, there were 21,000 pistols, 13,000 of which we're still in storage, which means the Nagant was still out in the field, a matter of fiscal concern, which was made worse by limited budget allocations. It wouldn't be until the remilitarization of Europe in the late 1930s that pistols came to be widely distributed. Training was still fairly limited, as it had been established during World War I when ammunition was largely unavailable. Those issued the 1914 used only 56 rounds in their instruction. If you were mounted, however, you got 70. I have heard that upwards of 145 cartridges were provided for follow-up practice, but these are still not amazing numbers in part because of these frugal measures the Kongsberg Wappenfrabik struggled to keep its doors open and employees busy. So it was eventually allowed to produce bicycle parts, tools, furniture, bottle openers, knives, and more. Commercial goods to keep its workers employed and available in case they were needed. As I said before, World War II brought more martial production, but the pistol was of limited use compared to, say, anti-aircraft guns, so the bump was negligible. 
On April 9, 1940, Germany invaded Norway. Attempts to blow the bridges into Kongsberg were made on April 12th. They didn't really go well, and the demolitions were called off. On April 13th, the colonel in charge of the region held a meeting to decide whether or not to fight. He found little will to hold the line. The Germans arrived that afternoon and threatened to call in aerial bombardment if there was resistance, so Kongsberg was surrendered without a shot fired. Factory production was halted in May, but by June the Germans demanded production be resumed. They were specifically after the 40mm Bofors guns, something greatly needed by the expanding German forces. Kongsberg director resigned, as did all of his commanding officers. The Germans had to appoint a division engineer as director and struggled to get production of the Boerforce underway. The Norwegians made this as difficult as possible, so only 200 were completed by the end of the war. Seizing the available pistols, Germany recorded the Norwegian 1914 as the pistol 657N. Starting in February of 1941, Germany would place orders for new made pistols. The first was for 950, followed by over 1,000, and then another 800, before a whopping 4,000 unit order in May. I'd keep listing these, but basically Kongsberg was back in the pistol business. Overall, Germany would place orders for 12,500 pistols from 1941 to late 1943. Now in the early years, 41 and 42, those pistols lacked any German inspection marks whatsoever. In 1943, however, rifle production was also resumed. This resulted in the short rifle model popularly known as the Stopperod de Krag. It also introduced German inspection, with Waffenamt 84 being given to the pistols. Over 3,700 were delivered in 1941, and over 3,500 in 1942. These numbers, by the way, do not seem to align completely with observed serials, but deliveries would have probably lagged behind the dates that were on the slides. No pistols were turned over in 43 or 44, but nearly 1,000 were delivered in 1945. During occupation, it's estimated that roughly 500 lunchbox guns were probably assembled in secret by the Norwegian resistance. These would turn up without inspection marks or even markings at all on occasion. Interestingly, the naval 1911s bought straight from Colt, along with other pistols provided by the Allies, served the Royal Norwegian Navy during the same occupation period as they had fled to Britain with the King and Parliament. When occupation ended, Kongsberg director returned. Production in progress was completed, with roughly 440 additional pistols finished. These were not German-marked, but some have been Germanified by unscrupulous sellers later on, so pay attention to your handguns. 750 were made in 1946, and by 1948 another uh, 1,130 were completed, though it seems most of the slides were marked back in 1947. There are gaps in the paperwork, but this is what the serials seem to suggest. Thanks to the war, the once modest production goals of the Norwegian 1914 had ballooned significantly. Throughout all of this, there was one noticeable change to the model 1914. Collectors today might notice there are a lot of different finishes on these guns. The first was a fairly light colored bluing, fine and nicely polished, somewhat comparable to the US dull finish. This changed to a still blue, but more grayish and rougher finish. Eventually a gray phosphate-like finish was applied. And in 1938 they adopted an acid finish covered in black paint, much like the British. This was used through World War II. Though the paint later flaked or failed and was often just removed, leaving the gun in sort of a phosphate-y finish. If your gun has a very dark phosphate finish, it's likely that this was again refinished much later on post-war. It's also worth noting that during 1945, this lanyard ring was finally dropped from the bottom of the magazines, although it's very little production that shows that feature. As the German soldiers and police were withdrawn from Norway, the government took over a wide variety of small arms. A great many of these were pocket-sized 32 ACP blowback pistols, mostly used by police and security. Though there were also some locked breech 9mm like the P38 and Luger. Even after selling off the oddballs, the government was now well oversupplied with various makes of handguns. So, when the Navy requested more 45 caliber 1914s in 1951, they were told, no, you just go put your hand in that big bucket of 32s over there. Over time, the 1914 slipped in importance, slowly falling out of inventory and beginning to be handed down to things like the Home Guard. Spare parts were used up and 
Colt was contacted to actually make new barrels, keeping the now fairly aged pistols in service into the 1970s. Finally, during the 1980s, testing was undertaken to officially replace the 1914. 9mm Parabellum had finally taken hold internationally, adapted into the official NATO handgun cartridge. Norwegian authorities noted the 1914 could be converted, but it was felt as frankly silly given their extreme weight and limited capacity even after conversion. Ultimately, the Glock 17 was selected as a replacement in the early 1980s. This took time to procure and issue, and as it was onboarded, the 1914s were sold off, destroyed, or placed in museum storage. Kongsberg Waffenfabrik would not be making Glocks, but they did manage to sort of make more 1914s during the 1980s. Bennett Arms of uh, Afton, Virginia, sent over 1911 A1 parts from federal ordinance to be reworked into look-alike Norwegian 1914s. The work was involved and expensive. It appears that only 20 were made this way. But that does mean, in theory, you can occasionally find a 1980s dated pseudo Kongsberg, which is the weirdest thing I think I've ever encountered. All right, with all that covered, let's ask May what it's like to shoot the Norwegian big bore. All right, once more, we've made room for May. Hello. And we have a smattering of things that look like 1911s, but only one is. Well, I mean, from this side, they all look like 1911s, let's be honest. This want some more 1911s. So much more 1911s. I have so many 1911s on loan. I actually sent some 1911s home last week. You did? Yeah, but for a while there, I think we had 12 distinct 1911s. That's exciting and also sad in some ways. I, uh, we had a we had someone send us one of the 1911 armors racks that uh -huh. I need to. I haven't had any time to restore it. I'm very sorry. Um, I want to restore it, mm -hmm. but it'll fit 80 1911s. That's exciting. I wish I'd had it restored for this, but even so, we wouldn't have it had wouldn't have, have looked right. It. Right, I know. Yeah, it looked weird and sad. I wonder. You know, we know the guys. I mean, like that tree in the Christmas lot. That was one of the last ones that didn't get picked. It'd be that Christmas tree. We know the guys at SDS. Yeah. I wonder if they have 80 1911s. I mean, probably. Well, they at least have 80 frames. Well, they're the importer, but it doesn't mean that they have them in stock all the time. I feel like they just open drawers and they just fall out. We also have some guys at PSA. I bet we could get like 80 1911s in one go. I want to fill one sure. of those armor's racks and put some tinsel around it for Christmas. That'd be cute. Yeah, right? Anyway, uh, what we're actually here for today is, uh-oh. I mean, this one and yes, this one. Yes, those okay. are the 1914s. <laughs> the Norwegian 1914s. Uh, we have enough for one for each of us. Look. Oh, cute. Yeah. Uh, this one's actually in better shape, although it has the light grips that I. I think these were replaced later on because they're always thicker. Mm -hmm. I've noticed the light grips, the it's light color grips. They're a little bit thicker, yeah. They're always thicker. And I wonder if it's. Be they feel like they're lighter wood. So I wonder if they made them thicker because they were like a local wood or something, or I I'm an idiot and the importer put these on. Could but, be. I don't know. I don't know the whole story there. So we have 1914s. Yes, and between the two 1914s that we have, that's the one I shot. Yes, that's correct. This one was the loan from Mr. Clear. Yeah. So that one has a replacement barrel and okay. some other weird stuff going on. Sure. Uh, compared to our Colt 1911 government model, there are actually a lot of little machining differences in the sense that these are not interchangeable with each other without some hand fitting. Okay. However, you'd be hard pressed to detect them. I'm not going to ask you to try to explain the little thousandths of an inch in either direction. Yeah, I feel like that would be difficult. They're chambering 45 ACP, both of them, although, as you saw in our episode, the Norwegians tinkered their cartridge to be slightly different. We were not able to reproduce exactly that cartridge. We just used 45 ACP for filming. Which they can handle just fine. So you're not about to tell me there's any recoil differences or anything like that? No. Nah. Unfortunately, not the, real much. There is one critical difference, though. A huge critical. Yeah, so if you'll set that down, okay. I think we can spell it out for you guys at home. Mm -hmm. Now, all these guns have magazines that are old and worn in various uh, disrepair or spring tension. So I'm going to remove the magazine as a qualifier here. Okay. I'm going to hand you this. Okay. And I'm going to ask you to, let's pay attention to your camera mm -hmm. and see how difficult it is to release that slide with a normal grip. Well, with a normal grip, and I haven't changed it since I got it, I can't really reach it. So I'm having to go around it. But luckily, it doesn't require much of a touch-off in order to actually drop the slide. However, you have I've, really had to warp, I've had to warp my grip significantly to reach it because of my thumbs. Now, granted, my hands are close to the average size of a soldiers at that time. Maybe. So. It's hard to say. You're close to the average height. Yeah. I don't know the average thumb length. 
Oh, they didn't Which, measure that. It really reminds. They didn't measure that, did they? It reminds me of the trials. Remember the trials data where we found a man with an abnormally small hand and a man with an abnormally large hand, and they all were fun. That was one of my favorite things with the hammer test. Right. What so, about you? How does it do for you? Uh, for me, I have large normal hands, so I can just touch off. I don't have to break my grip. I can do it at. So this is something May can't do. I can extend the pistol mm -hmm. as if I'm aiming down the sights. I'm perfectly aimed. I could shoot, and I'll just drop my thumb. Right. And now I can only do that with the bare leading edge of my thumb. It's not a positive position. It's one that I'm sort of touching in on. Mm -hmm. And granted, if you extended this to the rear, it's likely that I would bump it by accident while shooting. It and could happen. You're not wrong. I do this on Steyr M9s. If I grip too high on an M9 Steyr, mm -hmm. uh, it'll never lock open because I'll ride the release. Right. That, that happens to me all the time with those pistols. Okay. So... So that is the slide release on that Colt Brush Blue that we shot previously. Yes, that's also the reason why you don't necessarily extend the whole slide release. Instead, mm -hmm. they dropped it down and brought it back and tucked it under the grip. Like a little hook. Right. So uh, let's go ahead and try that. We'll go ahead and remove the mag because the mag springs, the reason I'm removing the mags is these follower springs do not have the same tension across the board. Mm -hmm. And I want to be a factor in what May's doing. Okay. So we're just basically talking about reaching it. We're not talking about how much pressure. All right, I've got the grip. Okay. And I can't. I can't quite reach it, but I'm closer. I'm much closer than I was You're to the cold brush blue. So you scooched how much? Like just a little tiny? Yeah, just a little. T oh, there we go. Yeah, okay. I didn't have to scooch as far. I mean, so that's how pretty much good. scooching is that? It, well, I I don't know. I can't half really. Half the scooching of the other one? Probably about half. You're not wrong. If I were to compare the two, it's probably about half. Okay, so now me with big man hand. That's probably just naturally. So I'm able to, if I were to, if I'm trying to work the safety and I just drop into the safety and leave a high position, my thumb's not in any contact with the slide release at all. And then if I just drop it down just a little tiny bit, I can find it, very intentionally find it. Mm -hmm. And it's right in the middle, and I'm sorry, this camera is not as geared. It's right in the middle of the pad of my thumb. Mm -hmm. And I can just drop that, although I'm saying that and I'm in an awkward position next to my head. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, it's actually very easy to locate. It's very easy to use when I want to use it because I just touch that thumb in a little bit. Uh huh. But I will say, it also feels better shrouded it, than the original. It actually is better yeah. protected against accidental use. I think so too. I genuinely think this is a smarter design. And it doesn't touch off quite as easily as the brush blue does. And that it, it, it requires a little more force, just a little bit, which I think is actually pretty good. Yeah, that may also just be the sort of the cut shape in the slide here. It could be. Uh, you know what? We actually have another 1914. Let's see. I'll take the mag out of that guy's. Good definitive answer. How how light or heavy is that to drop? Okay. Same grip. This one's actually a little bit lighter. Yeah, it may be that this one's just gotten a little wear in it. It could be. Actually, that might have been what caught me off. Yeah. Let me try. Because I realized I had to put slightly more flex just like you. Oh no, this one's Yeah, that one's lighter. This one's easy. Yeah. Also, now I can't hear out of this ear. That's fine. Okay. You don't need to. <laughs> You're born with two, so realistically you could give one up. <gasps> but that's reasonably the biggest difference that you feel. Like that's, if anything, that might be the only difference aside from maybe a little bit of extra thickness in the grips that I have. Yeah, no recoil problems, no sighting differences. No. I mean, the sights are slightly different shaped in the sense of the outside bevels, but not in any way you not never notice. Not critically noticeable though. So between a Norwegian 1914 mm -hmm. and a Colt 1911, I kind of want to go with the 1914. Yeah? Yeah, just because that slide release improvement, I think, is a significant improvement. Was there anything about using the 1914s that put you off? Um, Not especially, no, because performance-wise, they were pretty much the same. Trigger felt the same. Build uh, quality. Yeah, the actual rack and the slide. Everything spring-wise kind of felt pretty comparable against an average of the 1911s I've shot. The funny thing about the 1914s, too, is you can tell if somebody kind of monkeyed with it because they serialized everything. Oh, that's fantastic. You were so, talking about that. Yeah, yeah, a lot of old Colts, you know, you have to sit there... Well, you know, we were talking about this Argentine last time that uh, Bruno's been putting back together in its original configuration after it had been sort of toyed with. Yes. Uh, it still has an oversized beaver tail. Mm -hmm. So we know that that's a replacement part, but we actually don't know much else about what was replaced or not, especially after it's been reblued at some point in its life. Right. Whereas with the Norwegians, you know, because they are stamped. You do. Now, they could replace parts at the armory, but mm -hmm. then they would re-stamp them with the correct serial number, so you know it's armory redone. Right, so then you know it's got that armory kiss of yeah. finish. Yeah, <laughs> somebody else is uh, liable. So, right, exactly. I mean, they're dead now, but or retired, I mean, maybe. you can still shake your fist at their grave. Yeah, I mean, Norwegians lived for a while. They could be alive, I guess. But, um, 
the, the 1914 inspires a lot of confidence. It really does. And I distinctly think it does have an actual improved component in the form of that slide release. I do too, which is why I think if I had to choose between the two, I'd probably just go for the Norwegian. And it's such a small thing, by the way, I want to point out. Otherwise, performance, it's identical to the Colt. So if we go to do an episode, because um, we do probably need to get around to doing our top 10 automatic pistols episode like we did with That'd the Colt actions back in the day. Oh, does that mean that we should, we have to pick either just a regular Colt 1911 or we can pick the 1914? Well, I was going to ask, are you going to name the 1914 your number one pistol of World War One? If I have to compare between the two, I mean, well, that's just it. Should we even put it in the running? Should we only let whatever the top... 1911 is in the running. No, no, no. I'm saying, would you name the 1914? Well, don't one? give away the whole episode. Okay. It doesn't matter. It can't be entered. The 1914 didn't make it into production mm, until after the war. 1919 is the earliest date for one of these guys. The pre-upgraded model, technically... You're, what, you're touching the Colt 1911. Oh, i Yeah. The, <laughs> the, the pre-production run, the God, small run... 1911 is confused. Was... People call model 1912s, and we cover in this episode. That's just a... That's just an, a, a, a back-end bookkeeping thing, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't have the extended slide release. So there was no option for that extended slide release before the end of World War One. Okay. So you can't pick it. I know. You're not allowed. I know. You're going to trick me with that. Yeah, I was tricking. You're being a jerk. Anyway, uh, I think that's kind of wrapped up for this one, right? Pretty much. Um, I'm really glad that we actually got to have the experience that we did. Without this huge smattering of tastes, I wouldn't have known that there was absolutely no field difference, really. Yeah. There's going to be no more 1911 content for a while. Yeah, we have 1911 to ourselves out for a little bit. I can't. Like... We still have shot more 1911, too. <laughs> We've already filmed the shooting oh segments. Oh, my God. I just, I don't, we're going to have to do the A1s, and then uh, there's so many 1911s. Yeah. But we've gotten through the hard part and the beginning part. It's interesting how little people tend to know about this early period, so hopefully we've been able to fill you guys in a good bit. And I'm glad that we waited to do the 1911s until after we had done a significant number of semi-automatic pistols for the war, because then I didn't get just to get to have what is ergonomically pretty dang great at the start and that would have warped my perspective of everything else after it well actually this is you're kind of touching on what's happened with 1911 history because we're always looking back yes right? the 1911 is still in production and it tends to be actually for most americans it is the old pistol that you end up putting in your hand at some point mm -hmm. uh you know you might have been shooting glocks and sigs and cz's or whatever and, and maybe you're going back to the wonder nines but when we're talking about someone shooting a very early century firearm, mm -hmm. like one of the first semi-automatics. Sure. You're talking about sort of the first 10 to 15 years after 1900. It's mm -hmm. pretty much like C96, 1896, all the way up to some ideas that are still getting fleshed out in 1915, let's say. And then especially being here, if we're, if we're spe specifically in the United States, the right. odds of it being a 1911 are going to be pretty high. I mean, anywhere at this point, because, because of this gun's outstanding... Uh, qualities it ended up being produced in significant numbers and sh yes. shipped all over the world. So the problem is most people, when they hold a really early pistol, they hold a 1911. It might mm -hmm. be an A1, but they're thinking, it, they're hearing the words 1911, they're thinking back to the year 1911. Right. And that's almost an unfair representation of how the development went because John Browning and Colt working together rapidly amalgamated a number of design principles and then... Um, I'm trying to think of the word. They simplified the construction so that you had uh, multi-purpose pieces. They really got it down to a very small number of pieces as a operating pistol. Mm -hmm. My one complaint about the 1911, and I know people want to hear my complaints, is that it is too complicated for disassembly. It is a little overly complicated they, for that. They, when it came to like the firing pin and extractor and things like that, they, oh, God, that's beautifully simple for disassembly. Mm -hmm. But then not having like a captive guide rod and things like that and having the loose takedown lever and things, not as good. Right. You know what I mean? There's some, there's some weaknesses there. So that would be my one complaint. But that's a very small complaint. Oh, yeah. When we look at every other automatic that we handled in that period, I mean... The, out what the it, wazoo for some of the complaints on some of them. The most normal one after these is what, Shire Han? It's still holding with a stripper clip. Yeah, that's true. Or there's a lot of pocket pistols that were very revolutionary, but they had no locking systems. Mm -hmm. And so they felt very modern, but they're just blowbacks. Mm -hmm. So in the context of going through a bunch of other automatics and arriving at the 1911, I hope that we've really spelled out why this represents a distinct keystone in handgun history specifically. Oh, yeah. Uh, so the 1911 deserves its praise. 
problem is everybody keeps comparing it to stuff that's come out 60 years later. Mm -hmm. And then also everybody keeps not comparing it to its real cousins, which were available at the time. Yeah. So. It's sad. Yeah, I know. But now we've done it. You guys have seen it the right way around. I hope we did well. And then we don't have to talk about it for at least another year. At least that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, special thanks goes out to a number of people for this episode in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to make sure that I uh, thank, let me see, Mr. Clear lent us one of the 1914s, the one we actually fired. Yes, Mr. Clear has been around for quite some time as a repeat lender. Yes. And then um, I also want to thank my buddy Rasmus, who really had, he got me some of the 1914 magazines out of Norway for me. Mm -hmm. But realistically, Rasmus has given me a ton of help with some uh, other Norwegian work. Yes, got, like the uh, the self-loader for that uh, crag. Or the oh, speed the, loader. the speed loader for yeah, my crag. Yeah, speed loader for the crag. Yeah, we already done the crag episode, so I've never gotten to give him a shout out. So thanks, buddy. I really appreciate it. Thanks, man. And then um, I want to make sure that we hit our executive producers. Yes. So the first one on this episode is actually a friend of ours Ooh. who has his own channel, <gasps> Tenacious Trilobite. Yeah. He's supporting us on this one, so that's pretty great. Yeah. Uh, he actually did more of a material aid, but that's okay. It counts as an executive producer. Absolutely. Plus, he's got some cool videos, so if you haven't seen him, check him out. Yeah, he's known for his POV work. Uh, I'd actually like to invite him down here. We've talked about it, and he's he's game. we just got to figure out when and how. Oh, so he's going to take our couch? Yeah. Um, Tanish, for anybody who hasn't seen his channel, he actually got to start, I believe, working out of our Discord mm. with some of the other community members. Yeah. So... While we're talking about that, our Discord is free. It's not part of our patron access, although yep. we'd love it if you'd be a patron. Um, the reason for that is I can kick anybody that doesn't follow the rules, and I don't have to worry about them being like, but I paid you money. No, you didn't. It's free. Just, so If you go to oldgunshow.com and the bottom of the website, there's a little Discord icon. Click that. If you follow the rules, you'll be fine. Yeah, that's another new thing I should tell you guys. If you have older relatives and they can't help, or anybody really, and you're trying to say C and Arsenal. Yeah, it's and a little going, hard on the mouth. Right. You it's can a difficult go. Mouthfeel. We, we went ahead and grabbed another domain. Points back to the main site, oldgunshow.com. Yep. So if you're trying to help out your uncle, just tell him go to oldgunshow.com, and it's a lot easier. We've got all our videos up there. Also, we do have another executive producer. Our most recurringest of executive producers, who I still haven't quite figured out how to thank properly, is Andy Wade. Thank yeah. you, Andy, for really making this show possible. Uh, we cannot do it without you. Dude, you have been around for, you're going to be around for a while too, and we greatly appreciate it. I hope he's around for a while. Yeah, right? Don't don't put that on him. No, I mean, like, he's going to be Why around for the episodes that? for a while. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Andy. All right, the rest of you, have a good one. Bye, everybody. <laughs>